hello. Welcome to the PhD in Educational Neuroscience Distinguished Lecture Series hosted by Gallaudet University. Welcome to those here in the auditorium and to those live streaming from across the country. This lecture series aims to honor world-renowned scientists in the fields of psychology, education, cognitive sciences, and neuroscience. These different fields and all of the interdisciplinary fields in between contribute to the new and growing field of educational neuroscience. They increase our understanding of the human mind and the neural mechanism of learning. This year's Distinguished Lecture Series theme is the origin and nature of language, numeracy, and thought. With our distinguished lectures in the heart of DC, we want to build bridges across fields and scientific communities in the area and across the nation. Everyone is welcome to attend, and we hope you enjoy these exceptional presentations. We are delighted and honored to have Dr. Schachter here today. In 1981, Dr. Schachter received his PhD in psychology from the University of Toronto. He is now a William R. Keenan, Jr., professor of psychology at Harvard University and the principal investigator at the Schachter Memory Lab. Dr. Schachter is internationally recognized for his extensive research on human memory. He has investigated how memories are constructed and how they may change or distort over time. His recent work includes studies on the effects of aging, attention and memory in online learning, the role of memory in imagining future events, and the use of neuroimaging to better understand the neural underpinnings of memory. He has been an honored guest at universities and conferences all over the world, serves on numerous professional and editorial advisory boards, has and has received multiple awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Award for Distinguished Scientific Contributions from the American Psychological Association, and most recently, the William James Fellow Award from the Association for Psychological Science. He is also a widely published author, including two well-known books, Searching for Memory and The Seven Sins of Memory, both named New York Times Notable Books of the Year and awarded the APA's William James Book Award. Today we will learn more about Dr. Schachter's work on the role of memory in thinking about future events and the implications of these findings for our broader understanding of human cognition. The title of the talk is Constructive Memory and Imagining the Future. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Schachter. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. I'm pleased to be able to participate in this lecture series, and uh, I've really had a great visit today, getting to meet a lot of new people and learn about all the interesting things that are uh, going on in this educational neuroscience program. Uh, the work I'm going to focus on my, in my talk today is relatively recent work in my lab, really all of it, I think, dating to the past 10 years and most of it just the past few years. But the talk has roots in two much earlier developments that I want to mention first uh, that relate to the two aspects of my title, Constructive Memory and Imagining the Future. Many psychologists will recognize the picture of the individual shown in the slide, that's Sir Frederick Bartlett famous British psychologist who back in 1932 published an important book called Remembering. 
And in that book, Bartlett carried out numerous experiments where he asked people to remember stories that he read to them. And what was interesting is that people rarely just remembered the story as it was presented. Instead, they introduced all kinds of interesting errors and distortions into their memory. And on the basis of those observations, uh, Bartlett uh, concluded uh, his book or reached the reached a very well-known uh, 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 conclusion in his book, shown on the slide. The first notion to get rid of is that memory is primarily or literally reduplicative or reproductive. In a world of constantly changing environment, literal recall is extraordinarily unimportant. Memory appears to be a, an affair of construction rather than reproduction. And I think it's fair to say that most people in the field would agree that Bartlett's insights into memory as a fundamentally constructive uh, process, although it can certainly be accurate on many occasions, nonetheless, the view of memory as having a very strong constructive component uh, turned out to be right. Um, so when I use the term constructive process in this talk in reference to memory, what I'm referring to is the idea that when we remember a past experience, it's not just like replaying uh, an event on a, a video recorder. Rather, we're taking bits and pieces or elements of uh, what happened in an episode, uh, what happened in other experiences. We're bringing in our prior knowledge, our beliefs, and it's the sum total of all that that we bring together, that construction that is a memory. So the constructive view of, of memory informs a lot of the work uh, that I'm going to talk about today. But what I want to do is marry it up with another line of research that has been recently developing and that it, it is often thought of as separate from constructive memory. And uh, this work uh, dates to the 1980s when I was still at the University of Toronto doing a lot of work with memory disordered patients. And I'm not sure how well you can see him on the slide here. Uh, but what I'm showing is a picture of an amnesic patient who a number of us, Endel Tulving, Mars Moskovich, myself and others in Toronto in the 1980s were studying, uh, known in the literature by the uh, uh, initials KC. KC had become amnesic as a result of a head injury. He suffered in a motorcycle accident when he, was, when he was in his early 30s that damaged the medial temporal lobes in the hippocampus, important structures for memory, the frontal lobes, and a couple of other parts of the brain. And the net result of that was he had one of the most severe memory impairments in the uh, neuropsychological literature. Casey could not remember a single past experience that had happened to them, that had happened to him at any time. He had general knowledge, what Tulving and others have referred to as semantic memory, so he knew that pa Paris was the capital of France, for example, that was all fine. He knew a lot of general things about his past, he knew the names of his parents and where he grew up, but when you got down to the level of remembering a specific episode, Casey just couldn't do it. So he was entirely lacking in what uh, Tulving called episodic memory, our ability to recollect past events while having pretty good semantic memory, general knowledge of the world. Well, the observation relevant to this talk occurred one day when both Tulving and I were actually in a testing room with KC, and Tulving asked him a very simple but what turned out to be a revealing question. He asked the patient, what do you think you're going to do tomorrow? Try to think about what you're going to do tomorrow and imagine what you might do. And I still remember his response very vividly because it was so surprising. He couldn't come up with any particular thing he might do tomorrow in the same way that he couldn't remember any particular thing he had done yesterday. Eventually, with a little uh, probing, he would say things like, I might have breakfast and I might have lunch, but he couldn't conjure up any one episode of something that might happen to him in the same way that he couldn't remember past episode. And that suggested something very interesting that uh, Tulving and a few others noted at the time, but nobody did much 
research related to it for a, a long time, and it suggested that episodic memory, which Tulving, Endel Tulving shown here, had defined back in his famous paper in 1972 as the ability to recollect specific past experiences is important for the future as well as the past. Because here, KC had difficulty imagining a future experience just like he had problems remembering past experiences. Well, as I said, nobody did much work on that theme, exploring the relationship of remembering the past to imagining the future until the early 2000s when a few scattered papers uh, appeared and then there was a, a uh, uptick of interest in 2007 when a bunch of papers on this theme all uh, appeared at the, the same time. And what those papers showed are striking similarities between remembering the past and imagining uh, the future. Um, I've cited a recent review paper here that I wrote with uh, Roland Benoit and Carl Spooner, two uh, postdocs in my lab, for anyone interested and uh, came out a few months ago in Current Opinion and Behavioral Sciences. Uh, but a, a few of these similarities, one, it turned out that KC was not unique, that many amnesic patients have difficulties when you ask them to imagine a future event or even just imagine a novel scene, they either don't come up with anything or they come up with a very spare, uh, uh, reduced, version of what people without amnesia do. Not all amnesic patients have this problem, but I think we now know from uh, more research that uh, many of them, perhaps most of them do. Second related observation came from studies of aging and psychopathology showing that uh, older adults and individuals with various psycho psychopathological conditions, schizophrenia, PTSD, depression, it was well known that such individuals tend to recall their past with less episodic detail than do corresponding control groups. And what was shown in a series of studies, some of the work on aging came out of my lab, was that you see exactly the same thing when they imagine into the future. So they imagine future events with less episodic details, details about who's in the episode, where is it happening, what are the actions. You see less detail and specificity, both when they remember the past and imagine the future. And then third, neuroimaging studies, uh, several published in 2007, showed very strikingly that when you put people in the scanner, ask them to remember the past, imagine the future, you see very striking similarities in the patterns of brain activation. So just to, uh, to give one example, uh, in 2007, Donna Addis, who's then a postdoc in, in my lab, and I did, a, did an fMRI study uh, where people were uh, put in the scanner, as shown in this little cartoon from a paper we wrote in Nature Reviews Neuroscience in 2007. Uh, they're in the scanner, they're given a Q word, and they're asked to either remember a related past experience, something that happened in the past uh, couple of years, or to imagine a plausible future experience related to the keyword, something that might happen to them in the next couple of years. So uh, in this particular example, uh, what is shown here is I remember taking a day trip last summer and walking on the beach. That would be a memory in response to a, a keyword such as vacation. So they think about it for about 20 seconds in the scanner. And over here, the, uh, the uh, participant is saying that I imagine picking out a puppy at the pet shop next year. So that would be in response to a cue word like dog and an instruction. Imagine a plausible event that could happen to you in the next couple of years related, uh, related to dog. So we recorded brain activity during these remembering and imagining tasks and then compared that activity uh, to brain activity during a control task where they got the same kinds of cues, but now did semantic and visual uh, processing tasks that didn't involve remembering or creating an episode. And what we found was, again, striking similarity in the brain activations for remembering the past and imagining the future compared to control. So here you can see most strikingly these midline regions the medial prefrontal cortex and then posterior parietal retrosplenial cortex, posterior singlet, show very similar 
uh, indistinguishable activity when you remember the past, imagine the future. We saw similar effects in the hippocampus and medial temporal lobe and a couple of other regions. So putting together our study with uh, a couple of others that came out that uh, same year, in our Nature Reviews 2007 paper, Donna Annis, Randy Buckner, and I uh, postulated the existence of something that we refer to as a core network that supports remembering the past, imagining the future, and related kinds of mental simulations. And uh, that core network uh, involved those two midline regions that I just showed you, as well as the medial temporal lobe, including the hippocampus, lateral temporal cortex, lateral parietal cortex, all regions that showed uh, similar uh, activity during remembering the past and imagining the future. And those of you with a cognitive neuroscience background will recognize that what we're referring to here as the core network overlaps largely with the very well-known default mode network, or default network, um, a network of regions that was identified earlier uh, because it seemed to show a lot of activity when people were not doing much of anything and just staring at a crosshair in the scanner. And what these kinds of observations suggested is that you might get these default or core network regions coming online because people are remembering the past and imagining the future and engaging in those kinds of activities when they're just sitting around in, uh, in the scanner. We based that conclusion just on a couple of studies that were available at the time, but there's been a lot of research since 2007 on this topic. And more recently, uh, my postdoc, Roland Benoit, and I carried out a meta-analysis based on a much larger group of studies published in 2015. And on the basis of that larger example, we were basically able to confirm the existence of this uh, core network uh, for uh, remembering uh, and imagining on the basis of a much larger sample. So that seems to be a very reliable result. If you ever want to see strong activity in these regions, just ask people to imagine what they're going to do tomorrow or remember what they did yesterday, and you'll see it. Okay, so linking back now to constructive memory, uh, another thing that happened in 2007 was that Donna Addis and I, looking at some of our results and others and thinking more broadly about what was going on here, put forth an idea that we refer to as the constructive episodic simulation hypothesis. Um, and the idea here is that episodic memory uh, is playing a key role in driving these similarities between remembering and imagining uh, that we just saw. We, we sometimes refer to as episodic simulation or episodic future thinking. And the idea was that episodic memory does so by supporting the ability to flexibly retrieve and recombine elements of stored episode to construct possible novel future episodes. We're relying on a very flexible episodic memory system to put together novel scenarios of things that might happen in the future but haven't happened yet. Um, and we suggested that this ability to flexibly recombine elements of past episodes is very useful when we want to draw on our past to simulate the future because the future is rarely identical to the past. So we want to use our past, but we've got to think about new situations that are arising. So we thought it was a very uh, adaptive feature of episodic memory that it would allow us to recombine experiences in novel ways so that we can simulate and plan for upcoming events while taking advantage of our uh, past experience. However, we also saw a potential downside that this flexible recombination can also re result in memory errors when elements of past experience are miscombined. So here's the conceptual link between constructive memory and imagining the future. What we're suggesting is that episodic memory, a key function of episodic memory, is to support our ability to construct simulations of future events, related kinds of phenomena, but a cost we pay for that is that this may be one reason why we're prone to certain kinds of memory errors, specifically the kind that result from miscombining elements of, of past experience. So that was the, the conceptual link referred to in the title of the talk. Um, we didn't have a lot of direct evidence on that at the time, but I want to refer you to a recent study that I think provides some very 
cool evidence along these lines, kind of a complicated study, I'm not going to unpack it for you today, but is uh, led by my graduate student, uh, Alexis Carpenter, just came out in the Journal of Experimental Psychology, Learning, Memory and Cognition a few, year, uh, a few months ago, and it provides evidence for a link between those flexible recombination and retrieval processes that are characteristic of episodic memories and memory errors that result from miscombining elements of distinct but related events. So we think we've got some evidence now to support that central idea. Okay, um, now these similarities between past and future events certainly at least imply a role for episodic memory uh, in future thinking and imagination, um, and that's central to our constructive episodic simulation idea. However, I would also say that these observations don't really provide conclusive evidence that episodic memory is really the, the critical thing here. Why is that? Well, I refer to data from amnesic and other populations who show similar uh, uh, reductions when they remember the past and imagine the future. But those patients, while they do have memory, uh, episodic memory deficits, many of them also have broader declarative memory deficits. Some uh, amnesic patients, for example, have semantic memory problems. Patients with schizophrenia, PTSD, depression may have broader cognitive impairments that don't just involve episodic memory. So it might be the case that those observations are telling us that it's really episodic memory that is a key driver of these similarities, but it could also be semantic memory. It could also be broader cognitive processes that are impaired in, in these groups and might similarly affect remembering the past and imagining the future. And I've told you about uh, observations of core or default network activity that are similar when we remember the past, imagine the future. Uh, but we can't really draw a direct inference that that brain activity tells us that it's specifically episodic memory. There are lots of things that are associated with default network activity, so we can't really, we can't really push too hard on that. So what I want to focus on now for uh, most of the remainder of the talk is some recent work where we've taken an approach to try to identify the episodic memory contributions to remembering the past, imagining the future. We'll get a little bit into creativity later on as well. Uh, by manipulating, trying to manipulate the involvement of episodic retrieval rather than just infer it on the, on the basis of the evidence that I've talked about today. And I'm going to tell you about two kinds of uh, observations, two types of manipulations that we've used. First, I'm going to tell you about a, a recent study using transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation, or TMS. And then second, I'll tell you about a series of recent studies involving a procedure that we've uh, developed in our lab that we call an episodic specificity induction. Both involve manipulating episodic retrieval. So let's talk about the TMS studies first. Okay, probably many people here are familiar with TMS. It's a uh, kind of a form of magnetic stimulation that can be applied to the, uh, to the skull with no, um, no uh, health risk that temporarily disrupts normal activity in directly underlying regions of the brain and creates kind of a, vir a temporary virtual lesion in that area when, a when applied appropriately. And it typically affects a, uh, alters neural activity in a, in a, in a very uh, restricted area beneath where the, uh, where the magnet is applied. And it, it persists for a, a number of minutes but then uh, dissipates. Okay. So the study I'm going to tell you about is one that was led by a postdoc in the lab, Preston Thackrell, just came out a few months back in the journal uh, Neuroscience, and it focuses in on uh, one particular region of the core network that I showed you earlier, the left angular gyrus in the uh, parietal lobe. And we focus on this because previous studies have shown that inhibitory TMS, TMS that temporarily inactivates or reduces activity in the ang left angular gyrus impairs various aspects of episodic memory and retrieval. So we already know that. Now the question is, does that TMS also have a similar impairment on episodic simulation, on imagining future events? So does that impairment extend to episodic future thinking? 
So here's the study. The basic setup is that they're going to have TMS applied, and then after the TMS, they're going to be given various tasks. And this is done in several, uh, several uh, block sequences. So the critical task, they would get a keyword, and they would either imagine a future experience, something that could plausibly happen to them within the next five years, uh, in one block of, of trials. In another block, they remember a past experience, something that happened to them within the past five years. And then a third block is a control block where they're given the same word cues or similar word cues, and they're just asked to generate uh, semantic associates. Okay? And there's 30 seconds for each trial and each task, and it's uh, blocks of uh, five trials are used. So each of these three critical tasks comes after uh, TMS was applied either to the left angular gyrus, shown here in red, that's the region of interest, or a commonly used control region in TMS studies, uh, the vertex shown in green, where we don't think that applying uh, TMS should uh, have any uh, particular effect on episodic retrieval. So we're going to be asking the question of whether applying uh, TMS to the angular gyrus as compared to the vertex is going to have a comparable disruptive effect on episodic memory and episodic simulation. Oh, oh, that's right. Sorry, just forgot my slide sequence. Um, okay, so let's look at the free associate data first. This is where you're just generating, uh, generating free associates to a word queue. And what you can see is that there's really no, there's no difference uh, between angular gyrus and vertex stim stimulation. Um, nothing even close to significant there. So uh, if anything's happened in the other tests, it's not, hap it's not a, a broad effect that just uh, is impacting everything. Okay, so here's the slide I was missing. Let's go into how we scored the uh, remembering the past and imagining the future task. So we use the widely, uh, frequently used procedure in this area. Uh, maybe note to some of you, it's known as the autobiographical interview. It was developed by Brian Levine and his colleagues in Toronto in 2002. And it's a way of taking details that people provide when they remember a past experience for a few minutes and describe that experience or imagine a future experience into two critical types of details, internal and external. And the transcripts that people provided in this study are uh, written up and then they're rated by people who are blind to hypothesis and condition for internal and external details. So what are those? Internal details are basically episodic details. People, locations, objects, actions in an event. Those all get scored as internal and that is uh, conceptually equivalent to episodic. It's kind of the core, the episodic core of the remembered or imagined event. External details, uh, on the other hand, can uh, refer to semantic details. Somebody might tell you a fact about something that was in their remembered or imagined episode. Um, so related facts, commentary about the episode, about how important it was or how meaningless it was. They may even refer to other episodes. So anything that's not a core episodic detail is coded as internal. And you typically get very high agreement between blind raters as to what's an internal detail, what's an external uh, detail in this procedure. So let's look now at the internal details. And what you can see on this slide is that compared to vertex stimulation in the uh, green bars, um, application, after application of TMS, there's a significant reduction in internal details, both when they're remembering a past experience and imagining a future experience. And it's just it's a very uh, similar magnitude of, of reduction. So there we do see the key predicted result that manipulating episodic retrieval in this way has a comparable negative effect on internal details and remembering and imagined events. Um, what about external details? Well, there it has actually the opposite effect. So there's actually a few more, a couple more external details that are provided both for simulation and memory. Um, 
after left angular gyrus stimulation compared to vertex. And that may be because, and we've seen this in other studies, that when you have fewer episodic details available, you sort of compensate and, and provide a couple of more external details. Again, the point here is that there's a, a, a similar effect on simulation and memory. So the conclusion from this study is that TMS to the left angular gyrus selectively and similarly impairs retrieval of episodic details when people remember the past and imagine the future. And I think that provides some stronger evidence uh, than what I talked about earlier for a common role of episodic retrieval in driving these similarities that have been so widely observed. Okay, let's now move on to a uh, second kind of manipulation, and it's a procedure we've been using uh, a lot in my lab recently called an episodic specificity induction. Now, what is that? So this is work, by the way, that was led, has been led by two graduate students, uh, Kevin Medore, who recently finished up with me, now doing a postdoc with Anthony Wagner at Stanford, and Helen Jing, a current graduate student in the lab. They've run uh, most of the studies that we've done on, on episodic specificity induction. What is it? Well, it's basically brief training in recollecting details of a past experience. We're going to train you up to get you into a detailed episodic retrieval mode. And we do that by adapting a widely known procedure uh, from cognitive psychology known as the cognitive interview. Cognitive interview was developed by Fisher and Geiselman about 25 years ago as a forensic protocol to enhance um, episodic retrieval in eyewitnesses. Okay, so they're interested in pulling out as much accurate episodic detail as they can from, a, 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 from an eyewitness about a recent event, and they develop this uh, procedure uh, to do that. We're not particularly interested in, in what people remember about a recent event or whether it's accurate. What we're trying to do is prime episodic retrieval mechanisms and ask what that does to performance on subsequent tasks, on later tasks. So the logic here is that by activating episodic retrieval processes, ESI, or episodic specificity induction, should enhance performance on subsequent tasks that draw on episodic retrieval while having no effect on subsequent tasks that do not draw on episodic retrieval. So that's the basis of the rest of the studies I'm gonna tell you about. Okay, let's look uh, more closely at the induction. So, Typically, what happens in our experiments, you come in and you see a videotape of people carrying out sort of semi-random activities in a kitchen. It's not critical what the videotape could be potentially of anything. We happen to have these videotapes lying around. We have a couple different versions of them. So we show them this videotape, and then in the episodic specificity induction condition, where we adapt the cognitive interview, we try to get them to remember that videotape in as much episodic detail as possible. So we would give them mental imagery probes, tell me more probes, temporal order probes, um, and then just to, to read the instructions. Uh, so I want you to close your eyes and get a picture in your head about the people in the video you saw. I want you to think about what they looked like, what they were wearing. Once you have a really good picture, I want you to tell me everything you remember about the video. Try to be as specific and detailed as you can. So we really want to get those episodic retrieval mechanisms going and then see what, how that impacts performance on a later task. Um, in the control induction, we've used a few different control inductions that all produce similar results. So I'll just focus on what I think is the best control. You've seen another version of the videotape. So typically, we've done these experiments in many, not all cases, where there are two visits to the lab, you come in, to the lab, you see a videotape, you get one induction, do a bunch of tasks, and a week later you come back, you get another induction. So if you did the specificity induction last week, you're gonna come back, see a different version of the videotape, and then do this control indu induction, where now we're gonna ask you to think back to the video, but just give me your general impressions of it. How well made do you think it was? Did you like it? What did you think about the people in the video? So you're thinking back to the video, but you're not retrieving all the episodic details as you did in the previous uh, uh, condition. So that's going to be our comparison. 
Um, let me tell you about the uh, results of the first study we ever uh, published on this, 2014, in the J Journal of Experimental Psychology, Learning, Memory, and Cognition. It was an aging study, involved 24 younger adults and 24 older adults, because some of the back impetus for this work um, came from earlier work on aging that I won't go into today. And here's the setup as I describe. So you come into the lab, you see a short video, then you get either the specificity induction or the control induction that I talked about, and then you go on to do memory imagination and picture description tasks, which I'll tell you more about in a minute, three different tasks. Then you come back for session two a week later, you see a different version of the video, you get whichever induction you didn't have the previous week, so if you did specificity first, now you do control, if you did control first, now you do specificity, and then you go on and do different versions of the memory, imagination, and description tasks I'm about to tell you about. So what are those tasks? Um, we use pictures here as cues, and you would see pictures one at a time, not all as a group, but just one picture at a time. Ooh, that's too bad. We're losing a little bit of our slide, but it's all right. We, um, in the memory condition, you'd be asked to remember a past experience related to the picture. So if I show you this picture of a beach scene, you might say, oh, I remember I took my summer vacation on Cape Cod last year and start talking about things you did on that summer vacation. We think of that as an episodic dependent task. We think that should recruit episodic retrieval and therefore be impacted by a prior episodic specificity induction. Second task is imagine a possible future experience related to the picture. So if I show you this picture in the, uh, over in the left corner of people in a shopping mall, you might say, okay, I'm imagining myself going to my local mall next month. I imagine where I park the car, and then I imagine I'm going to go in and spend a lot of money and do whatever I do in a shopping mall. So you do that for three minutes. That also, we think, by hypothesis, is dependent on episodic retrieval. Imagine the future. And then the third task is just, that's uh, blocked out on the slide, is just describe the picture that's in front of you. So if I show you this picture, you might say, well, there's a guy in a sport jacket and a, a white shirt, and he's dancing with a woman in blue, and there's another couple over here. Just describe the picture. It's kind of a control condition. We think that is totally independent of episodic memory retrieval. Episodic retrieval shouldn't affect how you describe that picture. So we wouldn't affect any, expect any effects of the specificity induction on just talking about a picture versus remembering or imagining. Okay, we're going to code these results as in the previous, as in the TMS study, using the autobiographical interview. Uh, we're going to code them into internal and external details for memory and imagination. It's just what I told you about earlier in the TMS study. For picture description, an internal detail is a detail that people agree is physically, perceptually present in the picture. That's an internal detail. And any commentary, inferences, related semantic information is coded as an external detail, just like in the memory and imagination cases. And we get very high uh, agreement on what's an internal and external uh, detail. So let's look first at the internal details. Let's walk through the results here. Uh, we've got younger and older adults. And what we can see is that what we're plotting here is the mean number of internal details they provide when they remember a past experience, imagine a future experience, or describe a picture. And you can see right away for both young and old that after they've just had the episodic specificity induction, they remember more internal details than after they've just had the control induction in a separate session. Same thing for imagination. When they imagine a future experience, they imagine that experience with more episodic or internal detail after they've just had the specificity induction compared to the control induction. But it's not just that they're producing more verbal output because there's no effect on picture description as expected. And when you look at aging, while well, older adults, this replicates some earlier effects we had are, are, uh, produce fewer internal details on all three tasks, but critically, 
they too show selective effects of just having had the episodic specificity induction on remembering internal details and imagining internal details. There are more of them after they've had specificity than control uh, and to a similar degree. And again, it's not just that they're producing more verbal output after the specificity induction because there's no impact on describing a picture. It seems really to be targeting the memory and imagination task, the episodic dependent task. And then when we look at external details, there's just no impact of the induction on external details at all. So again, this just reinforces the point. It's not just that they're putting, they produce more verbal output after they've had the specificity induction. It's targeting the memory and imagination tasks selectively, and it's targeting episodic details selectively. So the conclusion from that study is that the specificity induction um, dissociates the retrieval of episodic details during remembering and imagining both from semantic retrieval, so there is no impact of the induction on external details, and what I would refer to as non-episodic narrative processes. It doesn't have any impact on picture description. Now, there's an interesting implication of that result, which we've now replicated many times, a robust uh, result, is that we can use this specificity induction to try to identify, enhance the contribution of episodic simulation and retrieval processes to various tasks that we, aren't, we don't typically characterize as episodic memory tasks, we don't think of as memory tasks, but might, like imagining a future experience, benefit from episodic retrieval. Let me give you an example from uh, some more uh, work that we carried out shortly after this first line of work on the topic of divergent creative thinking. Normally, you, when you think of creative thinking, you don't really think of episodic memory, but there were a few suggestive bits of evidence in the literature that pointed toward a possible link between the two. Um, so what is divergent thinking? Well, it's the ability to generate creative ideas by combining diverse types of information. That's how Guilford defined it 50 years ago. It sounds kind of like episodic simulation. Um, and let, let's walk through uh, some of the suggestive evidence here. So one of the standard tasks that's used to assess um, uh, divergent creative thinking is known as the AUT, or alternate uses task. And on this task, you get a word such as brick, and you're asked to come up with novel but appropriate uses for a brick, unusual uses, but things that could actually work. And there are various ways of measuring it, but roughly speaking, the number of appropriate uses that you come up with is a measure of performance on the uh, AUT, or one measure of generative output on the AUT. And in a study from my lab published in 2016, purely correlational study, we found that performance on the AUT was positively correlated with the number of internal details that people provided in episodic future simulations. More internal details in episodic future simulations, more novel but appropriate uses on the AUT. Correlational but suggestive. Um, some work by Duff and colleagues indicated that medial temporal lobe amnesic patients show deficits on tasks that tap divergent creative thinking. And finally, uh, there was evidence from fMRI neuroimaging of default network activity, including the medial temporal lobe and other core network regions during AUT performance. So it's suggestive. Um, again, I would probably say that it's no more than suggestive because for the same reasons that I talked about earlier, these MTL patients might have other problems just seeing default network activation doesn't tell you that it's necessarily episodic memory, and this evidence was correlational from the study from my lab. But there's enough there to suggest that it would be reasonable to think that episodic retrieval is contributing to divergent creative thinking. So that's a nice setup for doing one of our episodic specificity induction experiments. Because if it is really drawing on episodic retrieval by the logic of our work, 
If you've just had an episodic specificity induction, you should come up with a few more novel but appropriate uses for objects on the AUT than if you've just had a control induction. So we did, that's the study that we did. Um, we asked the question of whether the induction would selectively enhance performance on the alternate uses task compared to an object association task where you get the object name brick, but you just generate familiar associates. Doesn't really involve divergent thinking. Okay, there's a paper on this published in Psychological Science for those who are interested, 2015. The setup is pretty much as I told you before. It's just young adults now. They see that same video, they get a specificity induction or a control induction, and they um, then go on and do alternate uses and object association tasks. They come back a week later, see another version of the video, do whichever induction they didn't do before, and then go on and do different versions of the alternate uses and object association tasks. So same basic task design. And what we found is that having just had a specificity induction, red bars, uh, it doesn't impact performance on the object association test. You don't come up with any more object associates, associates than after the control induction, but it does impact performance on the AUT, the, what is known in the alternate, uh, the AUT literature as the flexibility me measure, which is the number of appropriate uses or categories of appropriate uses that people come up with. Uh, and there are a few more of them after you've just had the specificity than the control induction. We've replicated that uh, several times now. It basically holds for all measures of generative output on the AUT. The ideas they're coming up with after the specificity induction aren't any more original or aren't any more novel than after the control induction. They're just a few more of them of equal levels of novelty. And we extended that to uh, another divergent thinking task where you have to think of uh, consequences of unusual situations and we published on that in uh, Memory and Cognition 2016. Okay, so let's, uh, let's summarize and think about some of the implications for brain activity now, bring it back to neuroscience. So the results from these studies, uh, they support, I think, generally the hypothesis provide stronger evidence that episodic is, retrieval is contributing to future imagining, divergent creative thinking, autobiographical memory as well. And what we've suggested is th this induction is doing is biasing what we've called the retrieval orientation of the subject. So after you've just gone through this induction and you're remembering detail, you're approaching episodic detail, you're approaching uh, a new task focused on generating episodic detail. Um, and we think that this increased focus impacts performance on later tasks where one of the things involved in the task is constructing a mental event. So you construct this mental event with a little bit more episodic detail after you've just had the specificity induction than the control induction. Well, that uh, characterization leads us to some predictions about brain activity that should be impacted by this specificity induction. So specifically, we predicted that regions within the core network that had been previously linked with retrieval of episodic details in memory experiments, specifically the hippocampus and the inferior parietal lobule near the angular gyrus, uh, would be influenced during an imagine the future task by a prior specificity induction. Because these are regions that other studies suggest are involved in some way with a retrieval episodic detail. So if what we're doing is biasing people to focus on episodic detail on tasks that involve constructing mental events, then we should see an impact of the specificity induction on brain activity in these regions. So we did that scanning study reported it in the P, uh, PNAS at the end of 2016. Here's just a, a brief uh, overview of, uh, of the task design. So people are in the scanner and they get a specificity induction. We don't scan 
when they're getting the specificity induction. They see the video as usual, they see the specificity induction, and we turn on the scanner and we ask them to either imagine a future event, as in the previous studies I've been telling you about in response to a word cue, or do a control test that we've used in several previous fMRI studies where um, you have to uh, generate a sentence uh, in response to a keyword and define the words uh, in the sentence. Um, then they go on and do, which, uh, do another induction. If they just had the specificity induction, then they get the control. If not, vice versa. And they go on and do a different version of the future imagining task and the um, object uh, processing control task. So let's look at what happens if we look at the results we ask just the simple contrast, what regions are more active when you imagine a future experience in response to a word cue versus the object processing control task? After you've just had a specificity induction, you see robust activity throughout the core network, as I said, a very reliable result. And you see more or less the same thing after you've just had that control in induction, where you're just giving your general impressions about the video. But you can already see, just from eyeballing it, that there's some activity up here in the parietal lobe after the specificity induction that you don't see after the control, and you can see much more robust activity in the hippocampus after the specificity induction. And indeed, a formal contrast where he asked the question uh, for those regions that were more active during the imagination task, um, you then ask the question, what regions are more active after the specificity than the control? inductions, indeed you do find uh, significant increases in the left anterior hippocampus and the inferior parietal lobule on the right. Uh, those were bro the broadly predicted regions. Uh, and another uh, core network region, the per percuneus, that often shows up in high memory conditions. All these regions showed effects of uh, the prior specificity induction. Whoops. Then we wondered would we get something similar if we ran this whole paradigm with the uh, AOT, the Divergent Creative Thinking Task? So we did that recently in this paper. It's just come online in Cerebral Cortex, for those who are interested, that reports these results. It's pretty much the identical setup to what I just told you about. Um, you're, you're in the scanner, you see the video, you get either specificity or control induction. That's not scanned, but now, instead of doing a future imagining and con or control task, you do the alternative uses task. You generate novel uses for an object or you do a, uh, the object association control task that I told you about in the behavioral study. And uh, the results come out pretty similar, a little bit different in some ways, but let me get this thing to move. There we go. When you do that uh, contrast, that uh, identical contrast to what I just told you about, when you're asking the question for regions that showed increased activation um, during performance of the alternate uses test, uh, which ones also show increased activity for specificity over control, you get that same hippocampal region that we saw in the future imagining study, so that seems to be a pretty reliable result. And interestingly, you also get some regions in the dorsolateral uh, prefrontal cortex and the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. These are not core network regions, but they're regions that are part of a control network that we typically see, come, uh, see coming online when people have to do tasks that require a lot of executive uh, control. We also uh, did a, 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 a connectivity analysis asking about how connected the core network was with the executive control network that includes those prefrontal regions that I just showed you during task performance. We wanted a measure of how connected they were, how closely coordinated activity was in the core network and in the control network. And what we found is that there was significant connectivity, but the important point is that there was increased between network connectivity um, uh, after the specificity uh, induction compared to the control uh, for regions that were showing uh, an AUT effect. So in other words, when you're doing the AUT, 
there's connectivity between core network and control network regions, that connectivity is enhanced if you just had the specificity induction. Now, that was of particular interest to us because uh, a year earlier, 2016, um, I co-authored a review paper with Roger Beatty, who's currently a postdoc in my lab, and a couple of other co collaborators uh, that appeared in Trends in Cognitive Sciences on the general topic of creative cognition and the brain. And one of the main conclusions from that review paper was that when you put together a lot of imaging studies, a signature feature of creative cognition is cooperation between the default network and executive control network. Those two things seem to coordinate. And that coordination was being enhanced by the specificity induction in our study. Okay, so a few conclusions. Uh, we've seen that the constructive episodic simulation uh, hypothesis uh, obviously posits uh, that episodic retrieval plays an important role not only in remembering the past, but also in imagining the future. We saw evidence that TMS, more causal evidence that TMS uh, similarly reduces activity uh, in the left angular gyrus, a key component of the core network when people remember the past and imagine in the future. And then we saw that manipulating episodic retrieval via the episodic specificity induction um, seems to selectively impact uh, tasks such as future imagining and divergent creative thinking, indicating that episodic retrieval in some form is contributing to these tasks at both cognitive and neural levels. But I want to conclude just by considering some broader implications of the task. So we've seen that of this, of this work, we've seen that um, both of these procedures have some, we think, theoretically important um, implications, they really uh, tighten up the link between episodic retrieval and these tasks that we normally don't think of as memory tasks, but, but do they have any practical or real world implications or is just really just, just something to inform cognitive uh, and neural theory? Well, I do think that they have some uh, real world implications because it turns out that these episodic retrieval and simulation processes that are targeted by the episodic specificity induction, there's evidence out there to suggest that these processes are related in a meaningful way to psychological well-being. I wrote a paper in 2012 in American Psychologist summarizing some of this evidence, but let me just give you one example, and then I'll just tell you about one more study, and then I'll, and then I'll be quiet. Um, there's a nice study by Brown uh, and colleagues where they asked women with first-time pregnancies to simulate or imagine the experience of going to labor and arriving at the hospital on time, to construct basically a positive episodic simulation of that event before it happened. And what they found was that more detailed and coherent simulations of the event uh, simulations with more episodic detail were associated with decreased worry about the event and increased subjective pro uh, probability of a positive outcome. So again, correlational evidence, but suggests a link between some of these processes that we're talking about and in, important aspects of psychological well-being. So we got interested in that and wondered whether our findings might have you know, some more uh, broader implications than what I've been telling you about so far. And so we did one other study that I want to briefly summarize, and it focused on worry. Okay? We all worry about upcoming future events at times, and if we do too much of it, it can be psychologically crippling. Um, so we did, uh, Helen Jing uh, carried out this study in the lab, a study on how episodic specificity induction impacts worrying about the future, published in JP General uh, about a year and a half ago, for those who want the details. So there, this is just an undergraduate population, three sessions they came in for, and in the first session they would have to list 30 specific concrete things that they are worried about, these college students. So a typical one would be, I'm worried about 
doing poorly on the final for my psychology class because that would bring down my GPA. And it turns out that our students had no problem coming up with 30 events that they were really worried about. Harvard students are worried about all kinds of things. I didn't know. But they're very worried. So for our study, that was good. Um, we would then ask them, what's the positive outcome you hope will happen for this event? Well, that would be, I'd get an A on the final. That's what I'd hope for. And what's the negative outcome that you fear might happen related to this event? Well, I'll, I'll fail the final, and it will bring down the grade in my class. So we got 30 of these things, so we knew what they were worried about. And then sessions two and three were pretty much the same kind of design that I've been telling you about all along. Uh, they see the video, uh, same video as before. They get either a specificity or a control induction. And then they go on to do two different kinds of tasks that I'll tell you about in a minute involving problem solving and reappraisal. And then they come back a week later, see a different version of the video, same, same as before, get the control induction if they had specificity the week before or specificity if they had control the week before and different versions of the problem solving and reappraisal tasks. So what are these tasks? Well, the, per the problem solving task is what we called a personal means end problem solving task. It's adapted from a task that was developed by Platt and Spivak in 1975 called means end problem solving. And basically it tells a brief story where there's something bad happening at the be beginning of the story, something good happening at the end, and you have to fill in how do, how do you get from the bad beginning to the good end? So in our adapted version, we would say something like, you would like to do well on your upcoming psychology uh, final. The story begins with you worrying. So you're worried at the beginning, the but the story ends with you getting an A on the psychology final. Please fill in the middle of the story. So now you have to come up with steps to solve this problem. How are you going to get from this bad beginning of worrying to this good finish of getting an A? And you have five minutes to generate steps to reach a positive outcome. The second task was what we called an episodic reappraisal task. There's a big literature in psychology on reappraisal, reframing past events from James Gross and others. And so we used some, uh, adapted some of their procedures. So here what you get are six bad outcome scenarios. And you have five minutes to reframe it, the uh, negative outcome. So again, to, to read the instructions, please imagine a scenario in which you just found out that you did very poorly on your psychology final exam. Please now imagine and tell a story of how you're able to reinterpret and reframe the situation so that it feels less negative to you. That's episodic reappraisal. And then they have various measures of well-being, where they're rating on a one to nine scale how anxious they are about this particular uh, uh, issue, the likelihood of a good outcome, the likelihood of a bad outcome, and how difficult, how hard it feels to cope with these problems. And so we get these ratings in the first session, and then the change from the session one to either two or three indicates sh sh uh, shifts in sub uh, subjective well-being. So it's a change score that I'll show you. Okay, so the responses to the personal means and problem-solving task you basically break down what they say into two broad categories. Relevant steps, that's steps that actually lead you in a productive way toward achieving your goal. Uh, it's relevant to solving the problem. Other steps are steps that are irrelevant that in the judgment of the uh, trained raters wouldn't really solve the problem or just uh, empty commentary, no steps. And we uh, also score both of those tasks with internal and external details from the autobiographical interview that I've told you about uh, already. And you get high inner rater reliability. So what happens? Well, if we look first at the personalized means and problem solving task, what you will see is that the blue bar shows how many relevant steps you come up with to solving the problem after you've just had the episodic specificity induction. And you can see that's significantly higher than um, the number of steps you come up with after you just had the control induction, and there's no impact, actually slight reduction in other irrelevant steps. So it seems to really be targeting your ability to come up with relevant steps 
as you construct this mental event or mental simulation of how to solve this problem. Um, there are more internal details in uh, your problem solutions after you've just had the specificity than the control induction, not more external, fewer external, that's as before. And you also come up with more internal details in the re reappraisal uh, task. If we look at those measures of changes in subjective well-being, are they feeling better as a function of having done these tasks? And more importantly for our purposes, are they feeling even, even better after they've just had the specificity versus the control induction? So let's look at these scores. They're different scores of changes in ratings from the first session when they came in worried to sessions two and three. And here what I'm showing you are, are anxiety scores. So anxiety scores in general are going down. They're getting less anxious just uh, for various possible reasons after they've uh, been through this protocol. But the important thing is that there's a greater reduction in anxiety after they've just had the specificity than the control induction, uh, both during the means and problem solving task and during the reappraisal task. So we get that effect. There's a larger uh, reduction in the perceived likelihood of a, things turning out badly, of a bad outcome. So after you've just had a specificity induction, now you're feeling a little more optimistic. Things will turn out well. Uh, and both during the reappraisal and the means and problem solving task. And then the other two measures, we get it on one task but not the other. So likelihood of a good outcome, we get a greater increase after specificity than control on the means and problem solving task, not on the reappraisal task. And on, the re on perceived difficulty to uh, cope, it now seems less difficult to cope on the reappraisal task if you just had the specificity than the control induction. So not every possible you know, good outcome is observed, but uh, in general, it looks pretty encouraging. And so we think that is encouraging us to ask questions about applying this work in the real world, because in fact, there is a related literature on what is referred to as, auto, as autobiographical episodic memory-based training in various clinical conditions, depression, anxiety, and so forth, that use procedures not exactly what we do, but somewhat related to them. And there's a recent meta-analysis that was just published in Clinical Psychology Review by Hitchcock and her colleagues that uh, indicates that there's, you know, there's uh, demonstrated effectiveness for these procedures with clinical applications. So that makes us uh, hopeful that um, our procedures might eventually have some translational value as well, and that the study of episodic retrieval and simulation, uh, as well as the episodic specificity induction, uh, can have both theoretical and practical implications. So I want to thank people in my lab, thank my funding sources, and thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you again. I enjoyed learning something new today from your talk about the correlation between episodic memory and simulated events. Can you share your findings about the basic science implications, but they also have strong practical implications as well? So for today, again, thank you for your great presentation. I wanted to let the audience know that we have a survey and we ask that you give us your feedback. Also, thank you for coming, both those who are in attendance here and remotely. After this session, you can join us at a reception. But I also hope that some of you will take a few moments to come up here and ask Dr. Schachter questions or comments before we head to the reception. Are there any questions from the audience? Thank you very much for your talk. Now, 
Okay. Um, thank you very much for your talk. I have a question related to the Angular gyrus. So that area seems to come up in many, many tasks, and it's creating a little bit of a debate also in numerical cognition on what's its exact role. Um, could you give us a little bit more of an explanation about the role of the Angular gyrus within the default network, uh, mode network, and maybe in our I, I'm glad you brought that up because you're right. It's not a region that is only associated with episodic memory. In fact, it's been associated in some studies with semantic memory processes and a whole wide range of other things. That was one reason why we thought it was critical to have a control in there, our object, uh, associate, our, our, uh, object associates control task, basically, because you can make a reasonable case that uh, Angular gyre should could respond to both episodic and semantic uh, components uh, based on previous literature. So we're really well aware of that. We're still aware of that. All I can say is that under the you know, conditions of this experiment, the impact was selective to the internal details on the memory and imagination test. That's not to say that Angular Gyrus only does episodic re retrieval. Clearly, that's wrong. And I don't know that, that we have a unified, overarching uh, characterization of that region given how it shows up in so many tasks. But in light of the previous evidence linking to episodic retrieval, we wanted to say under these conditions, could we get a selective effect? So all I can say is under these conditions that we did get a selective effect, but it's not to say that that region is only dedicated to episodic retrieval. And maybe there's some higher order characterization of it um, that could explain how it could be involved in ways that it seems to in these memory and simulation studies, uh, as well as other studies. You know, and it may, it may depend. It may play different, uh, you know, it may do different things and different task setups and, and so forth. So we have to be very careful there in just saying that, you know, within the confines of our study, we found a, a selective effect, but I wouldn't want to over, overstate that. So I'm not sure um, how much you know about memory loss, but let's say that a person has complete memory loss, that they don't have any episodic or semantic ability to retrieve information. If you were to take that person and you know, put them out in the middle of nowhere, and if, if they had no past experience to retrieve from, would they know what to do next? How would they think about developing steps to figure out what to do if they were lost in the woods or at a place that they didn't know, if they had complete memory loss? Would they have to rely on creative thinking? Or is there a, a natural biological instinct that they would have to rely on well, other than memory. That would be a, a dire situation, a tough situation. But uh, you, in your scenario, you're still left with procedural memory. So there's a lot of skill learning and automatic behaviors that could still uh, guide one. Uh, you'd expect they would be uh, you know, severely reduced in the ability to function in an un unconstrained environment, but not entirely. Uh, you know, without any ability at all. That, that's not this, maybe the close to the sum total of declarative knowledge, but it's not all the knowledge that the organism has. Um, another point worth noting is that one thing I didn't have time to get into, but it's a little bit related to your point at least. Uh, there, there is a condition known as semantic dementia where the impairment really seems to be centered on the anterior left temporal lobe, which is important for semantic representation. And these patients end up with a very great difficulty uh, accessing semantic representations and operating on semantic knowledge in, in any way. And yet, their episodic memory, at least when assessed in certain ways, is not too bad. Uh, however, these patients do have clear impairments in imagining the future that are above and beyond what you would expect based on their episodic memory deficit. So that's certainly an exception 
to the, the frequently observed association of those two things and suggest that there are semantic memory processes that are perhaps more important for constructing a novel future event than they are for remembering a particular past event. So I'm glad that you brought semantic memory into it because I, I didn't have, have time to mention that in my talk. Thank you. I think other questions can be held just to make sure everybody can see me. I think more discussion for sure will happen after this in the reception. We look forward to that discussion this evening. Thank you again, Dr. Schechter, for your talk. We have a thank you card oh, here. Great. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. I'm going to fly away. And we'll see you all there at the reception. Thank great. you.